stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it.
Tony Khan! Tonight! With one announcement, he made all the bots shed some tears, man. I'm sure Tony Khan is quite hydrated this evening. Tony Khan announced the Forbidden Door, man. All these, all these months, all these weeks. What is the Forbidden Door? What is the Forbidden Door? And we got the Forbidden Door opening all the way. On June 26th in Chicago, United Center, man. Oh, my goodness. The dream matches. They are a plenty, let me tell you. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the importance of it. We're going to talk about what we'd like to see at the show. And will we see a certain cleaner make his heralded return? in Chicago. Wardlow and MJF continue their storyline going on into Double or Nothing. Gotta love what they're doing, man. It's the little things that count. CM Punk finally confronted by Adam Hangman Page. We are headed to a colossal showdown for the AEW World title in Las Vegas. The Owen Hart Cup got a lot more interesting. Kyle O'Reilly advanced. And next week, we're getting Dax Harwood versus Cash Wheeler. We got a lot to talk about, ladies and gentlemen, on this 420. There's no smoking in the venue, by the way, geeks. Okay? Take it out back. But there is drinking aloud. Cold beverages are a must. I'm going to the venue, guys. I know you guys are excited to get there. Most of you are already packed in. Jesse's serving the tacos. They may be shit, but he's serving them anyway. I got one question for you, though, before I get out of here. What the fuck are you guys drinking? I'll see you over there.
so very much for joining us right here on Off The Script. This is your AEW Dynamite post show for April 20th, 2000. Jesse, put the goddamn blunt down, okay, bro? Come on. I told you no smoking in the venue, bro. I'm not even done with my introduction yet. The fuck is wrong with you? Come on, man. This is April 20th, 2022. I am JD from New York. Joined by my very good friend, Jesse, inside the OTS venue, as always. Thank you guys so very much for joining us on this Wednesday night, wherever you may be. Bro, listen, how you feeling tonight? There you go. There you go. I'm glad to hear it. There's no static. I don't hear myself in the headset, man. We're good to go. There you go. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a big night ahead of us. TK, boss man TK, has announced to the world, Jesse, the big story. Another big announcement by Tony Khan coming out of Dynamite tonight. We now have, and you listen, man, fuck Chicago, okay? Yeah, why, why, do, why do you guys get all the good shit, man? What the fuck's going, what's going on here? I, I I don't I don't understand it. I I don't understand this. Uh we can't hear you. Who's muted? No sound, Jesse. Oh my goodness. They said they can't hear you, bro. Oh my goodness. This is Jesse's new fucking gimmick on the show. They can't hear you. They can't hear you. I don't understand it. I, I don't. Jesse's muted. No audio. Oh, my God, man. What? I... Listen, listen, people, people in the chat, man. We, we, we went over this yesterday, and we went over this today, and I hear him. I hear him on my end. And, and you go, can you guys hear him now? Before, we even, before, I, before I even get into a bad mood here, can you hear Jesse now, man? Look at this. I had a whole fucking thing. We, we're fine. We're, we're fine. Can we hear you? Not tonight. Blah, blah, blah. Can, can we hear Jesse? Say something, bro. I don't understand that. I'm about to jump off a fucking bridge here, man. No, you can't hear. We can't hear Jesse. We can't hear Jesse. Oh, God. I don't know, man. I, I may, I may, I may have to, uh, I, I may have to fucking sort things out here on a Wednesday night. Nobody can hear you. Nobody can hear you, man. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Nobody can hear Jesse. He's getting this shit sorted out, people. I, he's not, he's not unmuted. I hear him. He's not unmuted. Uh, he's not muted on my end. Uh, yes, yes, they should hear you. We can hear. I'm about to budget cut him. Yes. Where's your sound coming through, bro? Well, now we got. Now we got to fix this live on air again. This is. This is. Huh. He doesn't need OBS. He doesn't need OBS. Oh, my God, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm not putting captions on the fucking thing either, man. How do you guys... Uh, do I sound okay is what I want to know. Well, do I sound good? You guys can obviously hear me, right? Jesse's about to get future endeavored here, man. This is your fucking shit tacos, bro. See what happens? No, this is not a Discord issue, man. We were on Discord the last two days. The last two days. I'm about 15 seconds from just going on and setting the venue up solo, bro. I don't know. I don't know, man.
No, there's no, there's no problem there. That's not the switch. <laughs> That's not the switch, man. You know what? Uh, uh, listen, man. I, I, I hate, I hate to do it. F figure something out. Figure something out. We're, we're getting rid of him. We're getting rid of him. He's got to figure it out. I can't do this. Honestly, I can't do it. We're going back to a solo venue, live, right here on YouTube, and that's the way it's going to be. That's the way it's going to be. There you go. Look, there you go. Solo venue, solo review. I hate to do it to him. It is what it is, man. Flying solo on Wednesday night. I don't know. Listen, I take great pride in my, in my sound and in my setup. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, if I have to buy him a fucking studio myself, I'm going to buy him a fucking studio, man. This is ridiculous. Okay? This is it. I future endeavor Jesse until, uh, until he gets this shit sorted out, man. I don't know what the fuck is going on. And uh, if you guys came for Jesse, I'm sorry to tell you. He's not here tonight. I can't do it. I got I to gotta get the show on the road. I can't have shit sound. I can't have fucking shit fucking up. I can't have the chat doing what it's got, got going on. Whatever. We're going in and we're going to do this thing by ourselves, man. Listen, I apologize for the technical difficulties. This is a regular thing on Wednesday night now, I feel. And I feel like the quality of the content on Wednesday night is dipped. And I can't stand it, man. I really can't stand it. I'm fucking frustrated. Anyway. Anyway. Let's get the show on the road, man. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. That's Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for notifications. All my jokes went right out the window, man. Right back to making tacos, he goes. Follow me on social media at JD from NY206. That's Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. If you guys would kindly please hit the thumbs up. Let's try for a thousand likes on today's AEW Dynamite post show. Right here on Off The Script. Make sure you guys go check out today's extra. We did an extra FTR. They are sought after by WWE. And they want them back now. Of course they do. So I gave you the reasons why it's not going to happen. And I gave you a reason as to why WWE exposed themselves. So make sure you guys go check that. Also, Bray Wyatt, where is he? Where is he going to end up? And why he hasn't joined AEW or WWE and Alexa Bliss is frustrated with WWE creative make sure you guys go check that out today on OTS Extra it is on the homepage right now make sure you guys get those super chats in we'll hang out at the end of the show as always and the only thing 420 related that is accepted in the venue is 420 Super Chats. Let's celebrate 420 with some Super Chats tonight, guys. Make sure you hit that Join button. Hit that Join button. Become VIPs right here on Off The Scripts. And as always, my show is sponsored by my great friends over at Manscaped. Manscaped.com. Use that code SCRIPT20 at checkout to save 20% off and free shipping. Thank you to Manscaped, as always, for sponsoring this week's content right here on Off The Script. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Tony Khan announced that it will be AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling in a super show. And this is the big announcement in Chicago, inside the United Center, June 26th, Sunday. It will be AEW versus New Japan Pro Wrestling this is a major announcement that I'm sure is going to upset a lot of people. It's going to make a lot of people very happy. The people that it will upset, it should be no concern to you because they're a bunch of blithering fucking idiots and none of them know the importance and the big, the big deal and the nature of this announcement and what this does for both promotions. AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling have announced Forbidden Door. It is a pay-per-view for the United Center inside the United Center in Chicago on June 26th. They will have a joint show, and the Forbidden Door will be blown wide open. We're getting a preview match. Adam Cole was there to pretty much rain on Tony Khan's parade and pretty much put himself over saying that this deal, this merger, this super show would not be 
without him as he's one of the best pro wrestlers to ever come out of Japan and wrestle for Japan. So Adam Cole stepped on Tony Khan's foot or feet today. And in a preview match, Adam Cole said on Friday's Rampage, he will face Tomohiro Ishii in an Owen Hart Cup qualifying match. That is going to be tremendous on Friday Night Rampage. Cole introduced Jay White. White said that he single-handedly sold out Madison Square Garden, and this will be the same thing for the United Center in Chicago for the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. He single-handedly sold out Madison Square Garden, and this is not about AEW or New Japan, but this is about the Undisputed Elites and the Bullet Club. So there you go. How that's all going to come into play, we will find out in the next several weeks. Tony Khan was joined by New Japan Pro Wrestling's president, and they were out on the stage for the announcement, and the announcement was made tonight on AEW Dynamite. I, for one, am excited about this. This is tremendous. And the one thing that it does is that it shows the unbelievable willingness of AEW to really want to branch out and work with other promotions, which you don't really see coming from WWE. You don't see that coming out of Stamford, Connecticut. A lot of people thought that the, oh my God, Mickey James is going to be in the Royal Rumble. Mickey James is going to be the, 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 the forbidden door that opens for WWE. WWE is going to either buy Impact, some people were saying, or use their women's division and, and do this and do that. And, you know, WWE is going to be willing to work with other promotions. They're not even willing to fucking put over their own talent. You want them to put over other promotions, other companies' talent? It's not going to happen that way, ever. Mickey James' solo appearance in the Royal Rumble did nothing. It was WWE getting a bunch of shit because of the way that they handled Mickey James' firing. And WWE knew that, or they had all that blowback about it and the black trash bag incident. And they wanted to create their own little talk in the wrestling realm because they see Tony Khan opening the forbidden door with other companies and WWE said, well, well, AEW's not working with Impact like, like they were, so let's, let's see if we can uh, rub elbows with Impact. That's all it was. It was a forced agenda that did nothing to aid Impact in any way shape or form the other reason why they called mickey james is let's be real their women's division sucks they fired half the fucking division during the last 12 months and now they were uh sitting at a royal rumble pay-per-view with their backs against the wall they had no women to fill that fucking rumble and they called mickey james because they were desperate for talent so let's be real on that so cut the shit there was never a forbidden door in wwe and there never will be this shows tony khan's willingness to bring all pro wrestling companies around the world together because he thinks and he is in the mindset that if we are as one, we are stronger as one. If we are as one, it will be severe competition for the big dog in town, and that is WWE. I love it. I love it. Everybody gets a piece of the pie. They've worked with Impact. They've worked with Mexico. They, now they're working with New Japan. They are doing it right, man. It, it's like worlds collide. This is awesome. And I love every bit of this. I love every bit of this, man. The Forbidden Door pay-per-view is going to be absolutely true. It is going to be our pretty much uh, Wrestle Kingdom. That's exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be our version of Wrestle Kingdom inside the United Center on June 26. Man, the dream matches that could be seen on this show it, it is tremendous. Brian Danielson versus Kazuchika Okada. I know Punk has called out Okada for a match. We may finally get John Moxley versus Tanahashi, and the list goes on and on and on. Gorillas of Destiny and the Bullet Club versus the Elites. Look at the, the dream matches that Will Ospreay, can you imagine Will Ospreay wrestling somebody in AEW, in an AEW ring here in the United States? This is going to be fucking incredible, man. This cross-promotion shit is something that generates a ton of buzz, a ton of interest. They're going to sell this show out 
in less than a fucking day. And this is going to be mega, mega, mega business. I'm already excited for the fucking pay-per-view, man. Punk versus Kenta. Jeff Cobb versus Keith Lee. I'm seeing some of you guys in the chat. This is crazy. Who knows if Kenny Omega is going to be back by that time? I don't know. I don't watch New Japan. I don't follow New Japan. We don't know if Kota Ibushi is going to be ready for this show. I know he was dealing with some injuries earlier in the year. We don't know. But this is going to be incredible. Zack Sabre Jr., Who's to say he doesn't mix it up with somebody in the Blackpool Combat Club, man? I'm already fucking drooling over this show. I'm already drooling over this show. How it's going to be booked is going to be the next question that I have. How is this going to be booked? Is it going to be something that we're going to see materialize on TV? Is Tony Khan going to be bringing in this New Japan talent? Is it going to be like an invasion? Are we going to see the Bullet Club? Are we going to see all these main names that I just mentioned on the show? Is there going to be a legit, full-fledged story going into this like we usually see for an AEW pay-per-view? Or is this just something to whet the fans' appetite and just put dream matches together for the sake of putting dream matches together? I would be okay with that, but it's not really going to be as fulfilling if there is stories on television in comparison. This is incredible. This is incredible. It is so, listen, I was planning on going to All Out. I was talking to my people today about getting the Airbnb and getting myself ready for Chicago. I may have to make a trip to Chicago just for this show. This is a once in a lifetime deal. And like I said, Jesse, before his shit crapped out on him, I mean, this is going to be in Chicago again, man. They're getting all the good shit. They're getting all the good shit. But listen, when uh, Grand Slam comes back to Queens here in New York, you'll know where I'll be. So, I mean, I guess we got to give and take. This is incredible. Everybody was hyping up this big announcement. A lot of people were really ragging on Tony Khan. Oh, we can't. He can't do anything uh, without a major announcement or a big debut and all this other shit about Tony Khan and the way he handles business. He was out there as a face. He didn't really even say anything. He let Adam Cole announced the major super show with New Japan and AEW. He didn't even say anything. But Tony Khan ruffled so many feathers with a major announcement or a big signing, a major announcement, a big signing. A lot of people are in the mentality that he can't get a million viewers on Wednesday night without a major announcement. Now, we all know that's not true. Tony Khan's done that plenty of times and gotten a million viewers without a major announcement. But at the end of the day, He is showing his willingness to not make AEW the only game in town outside WWE. He wants everybody involved. That's how confident he is in not only his his brand and his roster, that he's able to just take all that and put it to the side and let other people walk through his door. This goes to show you once and for all, again, if you didn't really understand it, that he loves professional wrestling. And if he did not love professional wrestling, we would not be sitting here talking about a New Japan Pro Wrestling AEW Forbidden Door pay-per-view. This is tremendous. I love every bit of this. I love every bit of this. Can't wait to see what happens. And the dream matches, man. Tony Khan knows how to get people talking. He got a lot of people talking and will continue to get people to talk as we move on forward and we get closer to June 26th. AEW Dynamite, we opened up with one hell of a banger. CM Punk versus Dustin Rhodes. This open Dynamite tonight never gets old hearing cult of personality start my wrestling night on Wednesday night. This was a great match. And I said it on social media, CM Punk and Dustin Rhodes... The reason why I am so in love with what CM Punk is doing right now is that everything that he does has emotion and feeling, and everything he does has a story behind it. This was a fan... I wouldn't say this was like a match of the year candidate, but this was a fantastic open to Dynamite for the simple reason that it served its purpose of CM Punk getting a hard-fought victory over a crafty veteran who still can go out there and wrestle his ass off. And this is going to be a hard-fought victory that he's going to look back on 
when he gets that title match with Adam Page at double or nothing, and he's going to look back on this, and you're going to see the road that he took to get to Adam Page, and eventually, I think, he will win the AEW World Heavyweight Championship. This was great. Everything he does has a purpose. Everything he does has a significant story about it. And you can easily tell. You can easily tell. And there have been teases all through his run so far since he's been back since August. He is definitely modeling himself after Bret the Hitman Hart and the little things, the little you know, intricacies that he does in the ring, it, whether it's uh, the, the way he tells a story in the ring or what he does as far as uh, ring gear. Today, he, I guess he paid homage to uh, Bret Hart with the hearts on the back of his trunks tonight, did CM Punk. This was a great match. Really, really great match that really focused around the knees of both roads and CM Punk. So they shook hands at the bell, and they exchanged holds at the beginning, going back and forth. Nice couple arm drags back and forth, ended in a stalemate, and the crowd gave them a nice standing ovation. So Dustin's left knee was hurt on the fall. There was a fall after uh, he went crashing to the floor on the outside. He crashed pretty hard on the outside. We go right to a commercial break. Dustin came back in with a lariat. Punk swept his leg out on the apron, going after the, the knee and the leg which is, again, a story that CM Punk has always tried to go out there and tell. There's got to be something about his matches. He's CM Punk has never went in there and gave you a story that was basic or, you know, unimportant. Everything he does has a focus around it. Tonight was the knee. Tonight was the knee. In his match against Penta, it was the knee. A and that came off a obvious botch but he recovered masterfully over it and made it a story into the match everything he does is just great so they're in there they're trading strikes back and forth Dustin landed a back body drop before going into some offense and he did the 10 punches in the corner and this goes to show you how great Dustin Rhodes is he went into the corner gave him the 10 punches he jumped down and he came down on his legs, obviously, but he went right to the knee because he jumped down off the second row. He jumped down onto the mat, and then he buckled, and he fell to the mat, selling his knee, continuing to sell the knee. So he went and then did a code red, did Dustin. So he got the code red on Punk. Punk wanted to go for GTS soon thereafter, but Dustin hit his drop-down right hand and the snap power slam for two. Punk regained control with a chop block, on Dustin's injured knee, he then locked on a figure four, which Dustin eventually fought out with some slaps, allowing him to reverse the figure four. Punk grabbed the ropes, and he forced a break of this reversal. Dustin countered a diving clothesline with a right hand before hitting a crossroads, and then straight into a pile driver. He went for a near fall, only got a two count. Punk hit a roundhouse kick and went for the GTS, but his knee gave out. This was the other thing that I loved about this match. He went... For the roundhouse kick. And then he tries to lift Dustin up in the GTS. And Dustin is not a small guy by any means. He's six foot six. So he tries to get Dustin up in the in the go to sleep. And Punk sells the knee. He goes and sells the knee. He drops down and his knee buckles. So he went for the GTS. He sells the knee as the knee went out. And then he cradled Dustin for a one, two, three. He never beat Dustin with the GTS. He beat Dustin with a roll-up because of the knee being so damaged in the match. This was great. This was really, really great. The crowd loved it. It started off fast. It slowed down a little bit as they sold that story. Then it picked up a little bit, went into that next gear, and Punk gets the victory, not with his finishing move, but with a cradle, and that was it. After the match, Adam Page comes out and... CM Punk is standing on the ramp, and Adam Page comes out through the tunnel, and they just stare at each other. Hangman held up the championship, and Punk walked away. So, obviously, they are teasing it. It will be happening at Double or Nothing. The crowd erupted when they met face-to-face, -face, and this is going to be a tremendous match for the AEW World Championship. This is going to be great, and CM Punk un un undoubtedly, and, and no questions asked is going to win this world championship. That is the story of the entire year. Punk chasing the title and Punk getting that title from Adam Page. 
Adam Page, a lot of people, you know, they feel like Adam Page hasn't really been built up as a proper champion. They feel like Adam Page is an afterthought. I don't really understand how. Adam Page has had some of the best matches of his entire AEW run in the last six months since Full Gear. So I don't understand how he isn't being portrayed as the proper world champion that you guys think that AEW needs. He wrestled two incredible matches against the best pro wrestler, arguably, in the entire world. And he had great matches with Lance Archer. He had a great match, two great matches, actually, with Adam Cole. And now he's about to wrestle CM Punk. You know, he's not the focus of the entire show. He's not in the main event. He's not, you know, the closing sequence of every fucking dynamite. But that goes to show you that he is their world champion. And there are so many others on this roster that are capable of being in the ring with said world champion. At the end of Adam Page's reign, when he drops this belt to CM Punk, I honestly think I'm going to look back at it and I'm going to be very pleased with what Adam Page gave us. He's become a better pro wrestler. Adam Page has become a better pro wrestler in this world title run than he has before he won the world championship. And I, I think everybody needs to start respecting the body of work that he's given us in the last six months coming out of full gear. We went to a clip of Wardlow. He arrived at the arena. And smart Mark Sterling and security greeted him as he entered the arena. Sterling explained that security would be accompanying him everywhere. He said he'll need to wear handcuffs wherever he goes in the building. Sterling said he can have help changing if he needs it. Sterling said MJF had a message. I quote, eat shit pig. Thanks, bud. And then he walks away. So they put him in handcuffs and they said the security, or he said, did Mark Sterling, the security will help you if you need to change into your ring gear. Eat shit pig. Thank you. And then walks away with, secu with the security. Wardlow said in retaliation, oink, oink, bitch, as Mark Sterling walked away. And uh, he grabbed his bag and the security ushered him to a broom closet because I believe he changed in a broom closet and he did not get an opportunity. He was not allowed to be in the AEW men's locker room. So there you go. The little things matter the most, man. The little things matter the most. And I love that. They're allowing him to wrestle, but they're going to make his life and his time before he wrestles a living hell. And they're treating him as if he is not a part of the AEW roster, man. I love it. I think this is great. And it continued on into their match that we had later on in the evening between Wardlow and The Butcher, which I even loved more so because of the little things that matter, man. The attention to detail things that I usually pick apart on WWE television. They have nailed it down on AEW television, man. It's all these things that you would expect someone to overlook and not really pick up on. They did a fantastic job again with Wardlow coming out in his match against the Butcher, and we'll talk about it when we get into that uh, part of the show. Brian Danielson. He was with John Moxley and Wheeler Yuta. We're getting a glimpse of the trios. Tag team champions. I feel it when they are set to debut on AEW television. Danielson, Moxley, and Wheeler Yuta versus Dante Martin, Brock Anderson, and Lee Moriarty. Now, I get it. I've seen a lot of people complaining on social media. I was thinking about it before I even talked about it tonight. And I feel you. I'm in the same boat with you guys. I'm on the same page as you guys. Dante Martin is in this match, but where is his brother Darius? Why aren't we getting top flight? Dante Martin is also booked in a massive 10-man tag next week on Dynamite against the, the Undisputed Elite and no Darius Martin. Now, I don't know if anybody has reported anything about Darius Martin or if Darius Martin is injured, but Darius Martin being out this week and then again next week makes me wonder if something about his return is being held up and the couple of times that we did see him, maybe he re-aggravated the injury Maybe he wasn't fully healed from said injury. I, I, maybe he re-injured himself uh, on something else. I don't know. 
I don't know, but Darius Martin is not with Dante. And Dante Martin was, like usual, Dante Martin in this match, but I, I don't think Dante Martin needed to be in this match. You could have picked anybody else on the roster but Dante Martin to be in this match, knowing that they were basically going to be fed to the Blackpool Combat Club. So I don't really understand the booking with that. I don't really understand the booking with that. Lee Moriarty was here in this match because he's wrestled, I believe he's wrestled Moxley. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I know he's wrestled Brian. So that's somebody that Brian has also wanted to really scout and maybe bring into the Blackpool Combat Club. And Lee Moriarty wrestled Jay Lethal at the Ring of Honor, Super Card of Honor show. So he's been in, he's been in some things. And he's from Pittsburgh, so they put him in this match and they felt like he should get a nice hometown reaction in Pittsburgh. I, I don't know who knew he was from Pittsburgh. I didn't know he was from Pittsburgh. But he got a nice little hometown uh, reaction here in Pittsburgh tonight. And then Brock Anderson. I mean, I don't understand why Brock is not there. And then not Lee Johnson. Lee Johnson and Brock Anderson have been a duo on AEW television before a couple of times. And I know they work dark together. So why isn't Lee Johnson in this match? There, there, there were obvious omissions from this match. Dante is not with Darius. Brock Anderson is not with Lee Johnson. My boy Lee Johnson. I don't know what's going on. So this was a very, a very mixed bag of a trios match going into tonight's Dynamite. So Danielson came out first, then Yuta, and then John Moxley made his ring entrance, obviously, the way he usually makes his ring entrance. Everybody goes crazy for John Moxley. The combat club went right after their opponents as soon as the bell rang. Yuta locked Dante in a bow and arrow stretch, and then Danielson tagged in. Dante was able to fight both him and Moxley off before tagging in Brock Anderson. Moxley took down Brock with a nice half-and-half half suplex, and the combat club continued to dominate this match pretty much up until the ending. Now, we go to commercial break. Spine buster from Brock. This was enough to get him to make a tag to Lee Moriarty. So he gets the hot tag. Moriarty took out Moxley, Yuta, and Brian, and he landed a springboard forearm on Danielson, Rocked him for a little bit. They traded slaps and uppercuts back and forth until Moriarty hit a nice arm trap suplex for two. He then locked on a stretch muffler of sorts, and Danielson stood up out of it and hit the Regal Plex. Homage to William Regal, who was on commentary in this match. Dante tagged in. Took out Danielson with a springboard dropkick before a second springboard dive landed on Moxley, and this dive, he jumped in the ring, no hands, on top of the top rope, springboarded off the top rope, and then onto the outside on top of Moxley. He then went back into the ring. He threw Moxley back into the ring. He's on the apron. He does a springboard from one rope to the other, and then he almost trips himself up. So there was a slight hesitation on Dante Martin going for whatever he was going for. He jumps backwards, and then he lands himself in a fucking chokehold by John Moxley. So Moriarty tried to break it up. Danielson kicked his head. This was, the, this was one of the best spots of the entire night. And it really sells the viciousness of the Blackpool Combat Club. Moxley had the sleeper. Brian did his ground and pound kicks where he takes somebody's arms and just stomps the shit out of him. And then Wheeler Yuta was laying in some elbows. They all did this to all three of their opponents at the same exact time. And what a sight it was. Crowd went crazy. Then we get a paradigm shift from Moxley on Dante Martin. And that was it. I'm loving everything about the Blackpool Combat Club, man. They look great. And then Wheeler Yuta. I know a lot of people were making fun of Wheeler Yuta as far as his ring gear. It looked like he was not really fitting the overall vibe of the group led by William Regal with, the, with, with his old ring gear. They changed his ring gear. Now it's white pants, and it looks like it's a blood stain with his name on it, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's the little subtle changes that really go a long way. He was never going to really fit in completely. Attitude-wise, yes. Makeup-wise, yes. But the ring gear, man, goes a long way. And it's something that I always complain about when I see these makeshift tag teams on WWE or makeshift tag teams anywhere. And they're not really a tag team because of the differing ring gear that they have on. 
one guy has something on and then the other guy has something else on. Or she has something on and the other one that she's teaming with has something else on. They don't look like a tag team. So now he fits into the Blackpool Combat Club and that little subtle change of his ring attire definitely goes a long way. Adam Cole. Adam Cole, the Young Bucks, and Red Dragon. They were backstage. And they had a nice little get-together. And a nice little get-together. They were all talking about what had happened in the past couple of weeks. And O'Reilly asked the Bucks, who were not really overly, overly flamboyant and not over the top like they usually are. They were dressed in black like they were, like they were going to a fucking funeral. So they were standing there, very normal, outside of what we usually see from the Young Bucks. He said that they are the undisputed elite. O'Reilly says he's going to advance in the Owen Hart Cup. And Cole said that they've lost all uh, their matches individually as of late. But as a team, they cannot be stopped. He told the Bucks, all of their other friends are now gone. Cole said that they should issue an open 10-man tag team challenge. And they want to remind everyone, Cole anyway, wants everybody here in the Undisputed Elite to remind everyone how elite they are. I need you guys to be on board with this, he's telling Matt and Nick Jackson, because you are the elite and there is no Undisputed Elite without you guys because you started it all. So we need you. You started all this. This is you. So Cole asked the Bucks to at least consider the 10-man tag. And obviously obviously they did because it was announced later in the show that a 10-man tag would be taking place next week on AEW Dynamite. So you you see the friction there. And I do think this is going to be one of the big storylines going into the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. This is what we've all asked for. When when are they going to show up on AEW television? When is the Bullet Club going to show up on AEW television? We may be getting it at the pay-per-view. That may be the premise. They want to have a 10-man tag. We may be getting a 10-man tag at the pay-per-view. It may be the Undisputed Elite versus the Bullet Club in a massive 10-man tag. And I hope at that point it's going to be an elimination match. I think that would be fantastic. An old-school Survivor Series rules between the Undisputed Elite and the Bullet Club in New Japan Pro Wrestling. That would be fantastic. So we'll see what comes out of that. But I do think that this is the the, the premise to what we are going to get at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. We got a vignette about Samoa Joe's feud with Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutz, and the Giant Singh, Satnam Singh. And this was actually very well shot. And it doesn't really make me any more interested in what is going on with Samoa Joe and these three, uh, these three guys, but it was very well done. And it looks like Jay Lethal and Samoa Joe are definitely going to have a major role moving forward on Ring of Honor television until they get their things and their shit sorted out. It looks like we may be seeing this play out on AEW television for the time being. Then we got the major announcement, which we talked about. In the open of the show, Tony Schiavone stood on stage and he introduced AEW CEO Tony Khan. This was the big announcement that Tony Khan said was coming on tonight's Dynamite. Khan walked out and he took the microphone from Schiavone. He introduced the president of New Japan Pro Wrestling. So everybody kind of knew when he brought out the president of New Japan where this announcement was going. He shook hands with the president of New Japan. Cole interrupted Adam Cole, that is. Not Michael Cole. Adam Cole. Can you imagine Michael Cole in AEW? Holy shit. You know what? Now that I mention Michael Cole, man, I, I swear to God, man, I'd love, I'd love if Tony Khan gone or uh, went out and got uh, Moro Ranallo for this pay-per-view. I, 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 I Listen, I, I could dream. I, I could fantasize about it. I could fucking wish upon a shooting star. I would love... To see Tony Khan go out there and get Mauro Ronaldo to call this show, man. Can you imagine how great that would be? Holy shit. I don't know why he's not in AEW right now. Being the play-by-play guy of AEW. I, I-, I don't get it. I-, I throw a boatload of money to bring him on in, man. That man's voice could take the product to the next level. Anyway. Adam Cole interrupted. And he's on the big screen and he said... He's one of the biggest stars to ever wrestle in Japan. 
And this announcement wouldn't be possible without Adam Cole, baby. He announced that on June 26th in Chicago at the United Center. It will be the Forbidden Door. AEW and New Japan will have a super show on June 26th. That is a Sunday in Chicago. He said he will kick things off the right way with this Forbidden Door announcement on Friday I will be qualifying for the Owen Hart Cup tournament against Tomohiro Ishii. That's going to be a damn good match, man. I'm going to go out of my way. I know it's being taped tonight after uh, Dynamite. I'm going to go out of my way to watch Friday's Rampage, man. That's going to be a great fucking match. He said, as a member of the Undisputed Elite, he will win that tournament. He said that he had a special friend as well who wants to come out and say hello to everybody because of this announcement. And then out comes Jay White. Jay White is back on AEW television. And this is the first time since we've seen him since he's wrestled Trent Beretta on AEW Rampage several weeks ago. Tony Khan is standing out there still with the president of New Japan and Tony Khan was w- making some weird fucking facial expressions out there as Jay White said it's very fitting that he would be here for an announcement like this between AEW and New Japan. He said the last time New Japan held a large joint show, he single-handedly walked into New York City, sold out Madison Square Garden, and it was all because of him. He said it's not about New Japan or AEW, this is about the Undisputed Era, and the, or the Undisputed Elite, not the Undisputed Era, but the Undisputed Elite, and the Bullet Club. More more foreshadowing there from Jay White. Because this is still our era, and he dropped the microphone and left, and that was pretty much it. He walked right back through the tunnel. Again, very excited about this. If you guys want my thoughts on it, I gave you a good 10 to 12 minutes at the top talking about why I think this is going to be a huge deal. Not sure if this is going to be an annual thing, if it's going to be a one-off thing, but Tony Khan has been open to partnerships since he's opened the doors to AEW right from day one. And this is going to be a major deal for both promotions. Both And New Japan is going to definitely reap the benefits of this. Because right now, they're, they're pretty ice cold, and it's not even their fault. The pandemic hit them hard, and the pandemic still continues to hit them hard. They're coming here to the States to really use this as a stepping stone to get back to some of the glory that they had just a couple of years ago. And AEW, the dream matches, man, that's all they've been about, giving us pro wrestling. And this is Tony Khan's next step in giving us professional wrestling a show with New Japan, man. The dream matches, like I said, that will be had is going to be unbelievable. It's going to be out of this world. So I'm very much looking forward to this. And like I said at the top, I wonder if this is going to be a thing on television that we're going to see these these talents filter on into to Dynamite and Rampage, and we're going to have these long, drawn-out stories going into June 26th. I hope so. TV's a lot better when that happens for a pay-per-view. Jade Cargill. Jade Cargill and Mark Sterling were backstage, and he was standing there. She did most of the talking. She had her baddies, her favorite baddies, next to her, Red Velvet and Kiara Hogan. Jade called Marina Shafir a bitch, and she made fun of her about being the problem. And Kiara Hogan said, that's not going to be a problem because you're the problem solver. I want to say something here, but I don't know if it's going to come off in a way of, you know, the e-drones of me comparing uh, AEW to WWE. But, but I feel like we don't have a lot of women factions in pro wrestling. And I think Jade Cargill leading her baddies is actually a very good idea. It gets two women, one of which is signed with AEW. The other is not really signed with AEW. I think she's just there by a pay per appearance basis, but Kiara Hogan, a lot of people have wanted and, and validated her for being in AEW. They vouch for her being in AEW. And Red Velvet, she's been getting better and better and better, and I'd like to see her you know, grow and continue to grow on AEW television. Having them 
stand next to Jade Cargill is almost their version, AEW's version, of Toxic Attraction. Now, I don't think, I don't really, listen, Toxic Attraction is, is a WWE group. They are just very WWE-esque. You got the hot smoking blonde leading the fucking group. She's the women's champion. She's not overly great in the ring. Then you got Gigi Dolan and JC Jane who play the lackeys and they got the tag team championships. This is AEW's version of Toxic Attraction and I feel like AEW is kind of doing this to show that they aren't only, you know, uh, not building up new talent. They're not in this to only build up new talent, but they're doing it to kind of show WWE, oh, you want to have a women's faction as well? We can have a, a better women's faction with somebody who is obviously drawing a little bit more attention than what Mandy Rose is doing on NXT. And I feel like Tony Khan gets a kick out of that. Now, it may not be nothing, but I just find it very weird that this, this women's faction just shows up on, on women's television, on uh, AEW television all of a sudden, and it's not AEW's answer to toxic attraction. I could be wrong. I have no idea. But the similarities are there. So that's my take there. It's like, yes, it's like Team Bad as well. But we haven't seen a women's faction on WWE television in a very long time. They tried it. They tried it with Paige. If you guys remember when she tried to enlist Asuka and she tried to enlist Kyrie Sane and then she got misted in the face, which I thought was fucking great. But I'm liking this. I'm really liking this. And, and Jade Cargill is coming along, like I said. She's coming along, and she's getting a lot more comfortable. She's getting a lot better on the microphone, to a point where Mark Sterling isn't even really needed. He needs to shut his mouth. He just needs to stand there and conduct business with his fucking notepad. This is now about Jade. She's going to take center stage here. Now she's got women to surround herself with that could do her dirty work, and her energy and everything that she's doing right now on television is going to bleed onto those two, which I think is great because that's how these things are supposed to work. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing what they got going on. But I will say this. I will say this. I do not, I do not want to see AEW create women's tag team championships. I don't want to see it. I do not think it is needed. The more championships you add, the less valuable they will be because there's not a division built for that. Not in WWE, not in NXT, and it will be the same thing on AEW television. Do not, do not, they do not need tag team championships. The Butcher. He went up against Wardlow. And I love this. It was four minutes, and I fucking loved it. Butcher came out first. He made his ring entrance. He's there. MJF's music then plays. He's in the fucking skybox. He's near the luxury boxes with a, uh, a bucket of popcorn with Sean Spears. He announced from wherever he was sitting that Wardlow tonight, he is gracious enough to give Wardlow work tonight against the Butcher, but Wardlow is not getting any music. Wardlow is coming out to complete silence. I absolutely fucking love the attention to detail that I'm assuming it's a mix of MJF and Wardlow and Tony Khan. I don't know who else is involved in this storyline, but they have booked it perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Perfect. Has everything been in this story? The way Wardlow has dominated and decimated all these security guards coming out from out of nowhere last week with a fucking mask on as MJF lost to Captain Sean Dean. Everything is great. He's getting those reactions that Goldberg got during uh, the Attitude Era on WCW Nitro. They're chanting his name like they chanted Goldberg's name back in the late 90s. This is making Wardlow into a bigger and bigger act. So MJF says, you know, I'm gracious enough to give Wardlow some work here. He wants work. He wants to uh, go to work. I'm going to have him work. But he's not going to be out here as one of the members of the AW locker room. He doesn't have any theme music. He comes out 
to nothing but fan reaction and fan ovation. Two security guards are on the stage. He comes out with the handcuffs still on. Now, I love this because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, how is he going to change? Clearly, they're going to un unhandcuff him, right? So he can put his fucking clothes on. He had the handcuffs still on and he walked out to the ring and they uncuffed him just to simply wrestle tonight's match against the Butcher. If this was WWE, they would have had the handcuffs put on him and he would have walked through the tunnel without the handcuffs on. That would have been WWE's thing. But they pay attention and they do what needs to be done and it's the little things that go the longest. I love it. Every little bit counts, man, and they're paying close attention to even the most minute details. So the bell rang. They're in the ring, and they stared at each other from opposite corners, two big bulls staring at each other. They collided, and they barely moved each other. So Butcher threw an elbow to the side of Wardlow's head. Wardlow punched back, obviously. Butcher bit Wardlow's forehead. Wardlow came back and knocked Butcher out to the ringside area. They showed MJF and Sean Spears eating popcorn and watching. There was a little bit of a, a concerned look on MJF's face because Wardlow was in control of the Butcher here. And Butcher whipped Wardlow into the side of the ring and the ringside barricade. Wardlow all of a sudden comes out of nowhere and he dominates till the end of the match. We get not one, not two, not three, but four consecutive Power bombs, a power bomb symphony here. And in four minutes, Wardlow wins the match and he takes care of the butcher. What else does MJF need to do to take out Wardlow? You'll find out a little bit later on in the show because now MJF is getting desperate. He put the butcher in front, the butcher failed. And now he's going bigger and badder next week against Wardlow, which should be great. We got a promo with Eddie Kingston. He's wrestling Daniel Garcia on Rampage Friday. He said Santana, Ortiz, his friends are not going to be in the building. They're not allowed in the building. Jericho and the Jericho Appreciation Society, Hager and 2.0, they're not going to be in the building. It is going to be Daniel Garcia and Eddie Kingston one on one. He says he will beat Daniel Garcia. He said everything he does to Garcia is going to be meant for Jericho. So we're still continuing this. And Eddie Kingston and Daniel Garcia, one-on-one -on -one with no interference for now. We'll see what happens. Maybe somebody sitting ringside in a mask. We don't know, like Sting was tonight. But it's going to be Daniel Garcia and Eddie Kingston on Friday Night Rampage. We go into hour two. We got Jungle Boy and Kyle O'Reilly. This is an Owen Hart Cup tournament match. Kyle O'Reilly. He is somebody that I enjoy seeing wrestle. I did not expect him to advance in the Owen Hart Cup. And I was shocked at the outcome of this match because a lot has been riding lately on the Jurassic Express on Jungle Boy. This match was great. It was hard-hitting. It was technical. They beat the shit out of each other. And I was wondering. I don't... I mean, I'm, my, my wrestling mind and the way it works, man, I was, I was wondering about this because obviously Tony Khan is doing the tournament in memory and in honor of Owen Hart. Owen Hart was the second King of the Ring winner. Brett won it in 1993. Owen won it in 1994. The King of Hearts. And in 1993, the tournament that Brett won, he obviously wrestled Razor Ramon in the first round, Mr. Perfect in the second round, which is one of my favorite matches of all time. It was easily Brett's best match with Mr. Perfect ever. A lot of people go back to their SummerSlam match. No, 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 no way. That match at King of the Ring was their best match. One of WWE's best matches ever. It was great. Commentary was great. The crowd was great. The match was fucking fantastic. Then he goes on to wrestle Bam Bam Bigelow. And B Bigelow wins the King of the Ring. They reverse it because of Luna Vachon. And then Brett gets the win in the end with the victory roll. The I infamous victory roll. But Mr. Perfect in that tournament. And I was wondering if there was going to be a time limit to this match. 
because they were going so long. I didn't expect it to go almost 15 minutes. I was wondering if there was going to be a time limit to this thing. Because I remember back in 1993, Mr. Perfect wrestled Doink the Clown, not once, not twice, but three times to qualify for the 1993 King of the Ring. And I was wondering if Tony Khan, being that he's an old school mind and he's such a, a fan of professional wrestling, and I'm sure he knows just like, you know, all of us who love pro wrestling, how important those King of the Ring tournaments were back in the early 90s. I was wondering if he was going to take a, a page out of that playbook and do something like that, where somebody goes to a time limit draw, not once, but twice, uh, three times. Three times they got to wrestle to go into a uh, tournament match. I was wondering if he was going to pull a page out of that book. I would have loved to see it. That would have been something that flew over everybody's head, under, under everybody's radar, and I'm like, oh, man, I remember that. Mr. Perfect that wrestled fucking Doink the Clown three fucking times to get into the King of the Ring tournament in 1993. So I thought that we were going towards that direction here. But with the shock upset, and I do consider this an upset, because Jungle Boy is one half of the tag team champions, Kyle O'Reilly, he gets the victory over Jungle Boy and qualifies for the Owen Hart Cup. So this was 100% clean. There was no interference. There was no Adam Cole. There was no Bobby Fish. There was no Christian. There was no Luchasaurus out there. This was 100% clean. So Jungle Boy took O'Reilly down with a dropkick. And O'Reilly got the better of the exchange here. Went for an armbar. Jungle Boy obviously knows exactly what is coming in Kyle O'Reilly's repertoire of wrestling moves. Yeah, that scouted. O'Reilly hit three butterfly suplexes. We're going to commercial break. We're back from commercial break. Jungle Boy... Dumped O'Reilly over the top rope. He landed a suicide dive, followed by a comeback lariat on the floor. He bounced off the barricade and then hit the comeback lariat. So we're back in the ring. O'Reilly targeted Jungle Boy's back, his lower back. And we got uh, another rebound lariat from Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy sent O'Reilly into the corner with an overhead throw. O'Reilly came back and applied a wrist lock on the top rope. Jungle Boy, he escaped and started to lay in some, some strikes. Now, he was getting very aggressive here where Aubrey Edwards, who was the referee of this match, could have easily disqualified him. He was putting the boots to him. He did not adhere to Aubrey's five count at one point, and he's getting very, very aggressive on Kyle O'Reilly. So Aubrey backed him away. So he was about to put on the snare trap, but he took too long to apply the move. This allowed O'Reilly to avoid the snare trap, O'Reilly kicked out of a cradle, applied an ankle lock on Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy escaped, locked on the snare trap eventually, forcing O'Reilly to reach the ropes. So he breaks the hole. O'Reilly landed a brain buster and then climbed the ropes. He hit a diving knee drop right into the rib cage of Jungle Boy. And that was it. One, two, three. And Jungle Boy is now eliminated from all Owen Hart Cup tournament qualifying matches. He's done. Kyle O'Reilly gets the victory, and Kyle O'Reilly is in the Owen Hart Cup. Christian Cage came out after the match was over. He and Jungle Boy were talking things out. He was, uh, I don't want to say he looked disappointed. He kind of did, but he was a disappointed father figure, was Christian Cage. Because Jungle Boy did not get the job done. Now, I consider this a shock. I was shocked to see this. I thought Jungle Boy had it in the bag. Because that's just the way it is. He's tag team champion. I thought it was going to go in Jungle Boy's favor. But rarely. And I guess my shock comes because rarely do we see champions lose on AEW television. And I'm waiting for the fucking people to, you know, cry me all their tears Oh, well, if it happened in, in WWE, JD would shit all over it, but AEW gets a free pass. Yes, because Tony Khan doesn't, af doesn't abuse it, you fucking geek. How many times? When was the last time that a champion lost on television? I don't even fucking remember. I don't care to look back at those stats because they happen so infrequently. When was the last time we saw a fucking champion lose... On WWE television, all you gotta do is go back two weeks. A week! Champions are losing every fucking week on television. Ricochet lost twice a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, on SmackDown to Angel Garza and Humberto Carrillo as Intercontinental Champion. 
That's why I'm so shocked by this outcome because we don't usually see champions lose on AEW television. Now, Kyle O'Reilly, some people were uh, telling me I had no idea. I mean, I don't really pay that close of attention to people's backgrounds. He's Canadian. This is the Owen Hart Cup. Owen Hart is Canadian. Kyle O'Reilly advanced in the Owen Hart Cup tournament. So I like it. They like their Canadians. Fine. The other thing I was thinking about is Jungle Boy. The finals are taking place at Double or Nothing. Now, I'm assuming that there will be a tag team title match at Double or Nothing, right, in Vegas. Jungle Boy would need to defend the tag team titles with Luchasaurus, and if he won the matches that he would have to have in the tournament, he would not be able to defend those titles and have a finals match at the same time. So, clearly... He's going to pay more attention and make the tag team titles a priority. And Tony Khan's making Jungle Boy make the tag team titles a priority over being in the Owen Hart Cup. So just by that aspect alone, you could see why Jungle Boy lost the match tonight to Kyle O'Reilly. There was no way he was going to advance all the way to the finals when he more than likely is going to be defending the tag team titles in Vegas. And the finals are also going to be taking place at double or nothing. So Kyle O'Reilly advances and we get one half of the undisputed era tag team of Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish advancing to the Owen Hart Cup tournament. MJF, he was backstage, and Alex Marvez was interviewing MJF and Sean Spears. MJF said, uh, listen, he, get, he got angry with, uh, with Marvez. He wanted to beat the shit out of Marvez. And there's a lot more money where... This came from, so he hands an envelope to Jake the Snake Roberts. He hands an envelope to Jake the Snake Roberts, and Roberts willingly accepts the money. He says, this is all I care about. This is why I'm here. And he was sweating. I don't know what he was doing before the interview, but he was sweating profusely with Jake Roberts. He accepted this envelope from MJF that had a bunch of $100 bills inside. He said, some chase women, I chase cash. He said, the time is right. Lance Archer then walks in and he says, I'm not here about the money. He knocks the money out of Jake Roberts' hand. I'm not here about the money. I just want Wardlow. And if anybody gets in my way, everybody dies. Shoves the cameraman and the segment goes off the air. Cameraman picks himself back up and MJF is looking on with a look on his face like, yeah, Ma, this is money well, well worth spent here for, uh, for Lance Archer and Jake Roberts. So, go take care of Wardlow, and uh, I'll see you next week. Should be good. Wardlow versus Lance Archer, man, should be a battle of two big hosses, man. Even bigger than what we saw tonight with the Butcher. So, it should be good. Hook. We got Hook versus Anthony Henry. Anthony Henry is making an appearance. This is not his only appearance for AEW. He has made an appearance or two for AEW. I believe he's wrestled some dark. Hook made his entrance, got a big ovation from the Pittsburgh crowd. They showed Tony Nese and Mark Sterling sitting ringside, taking notes on Hook. And he's in there with Anthony Henry. This was not really uh, scientific at all. This was pretty much a squash match. Henry was uh, brought in tonight to make Hook look good. That's exactly what he did. Hook suplexed Henry early on. He kind of danced around the ring and played up to the crowd a little bit. He followed with a running lariat to the back of Henry's head. All of a sudden, Danhausen shows up at ringside. He does this outside, trying to curse Hook again. Hook is just looking at him like, bro, you're fucking weird. Get away from me. So Dan Housen's outside. He realizes the curse is not working on Hook anymore or never worked on Hook. It's not working again on Hook. He tried to cast this spell. Hook looked at him like a fucking weirdo. Hook locked on the red rum, and that was it for Anthony Henry, man. Quick two minutes of work here for Hook. Dan Housen gets in the ring. Crowd popped like crazy for Dan Housen. Pittsburgh loves Dan Housen. He entered the ring. And he took the microphone to Denhausen and he said, he has enough. I have enough of you. He said, the next time I am here, you will fight Denhausen. And he poked Hook's chest. Crowd popped 
for Dan Housen challenging Hook to a match. Hook looked at the hard camera right into our faces at home. He broke into a Hook-like smile. By the way, where are my hookers at in the chat? Gotta ask it. I gotta ask it. He broke into this very half-assed smile, and then he shoved Danhausen away, walked by him, and then left the ring. Danhausen stood in the ring looking confused. Hook wants nothing to do with Danhausen. So Hook is set to destroy Danhausen, and I'm here for that. Should be fun and entertaining, man. We'll see what happens. Scorpio Sky and Frankie Kazarian. Shivani interviewed Kazarian, who was about to issue an open challenge against Sammy Guevara and wanting his TNT title back. He is wanting a rematch, clearly. Sky said nice things about Kazarian because they're tag team partner, former tag team partners. He says he needs him to wait just a little bit longer before you go out there and challenge Sammy Guevara. He's got one loss this year. He's racking up wins, and he's about to make a statement. He wants to challenge Sammy Guevara for the TNT title. Great. Scorpio Scorpio Sky says, I'm going to need you to hold off on that just a little bit longer because I want my rematch against Sammy first. I want to get my TNT title back, and then when I do, you are going to be the first in line to get a title shot from me. I promise. Kazarian, he looked on, and this sounds like the words of a bullshit artist from Scorpio Sky. This is just how this works. Kazarian looked at Scorpio Sky and said, all right, I've always had your back, and I always will have your back. And that was it. He agreed to step aside for Scorpio to get the job done against Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara, speaking of which... Out there with Tay Conti. Now, I mentioned this on Twitter, and if you guys are following me on Twitter, which you should be doing, no questions asked, uh, Tay Conti actually blocked me on social media. I I I don't know why. I don't know why Tay Conti blocked me on social media. I've said nothing wrong about Tay Conti. Said nothing in regards to Tay Conti at at all, like these fucking geeks who are jealous of her relationship with Sammy Guevara. I've mentioned nothing about them personally on this show or on social media. I think the extent of what I said is I do think that they are right now being terribly miscast on AEW television. And apparently, I I think I said, and shout out to Just Alex in the IWC, he tried to reach out to Tay Conti for me and ask why I was blocked, and I told him that it was probably because I said during the Battle of the Belt show that with Sammy winning the title back for a third time, it kind of devalues the title, and I don't think the title has really meant much of anything since Miro had it. And I think a lot of people do agree with that. The the, the, the TNT title has been hot potatoed back and forth. Cody, we thought, had it, got it back, and he was going to use that to facilitate a heel turn. And then he just dropped it to Sammy Guevara, and then the next thing you know, we're seeing him at WrestleMania in a match against Seth Rollins, and now he's challenging for the fucking Universal Championship. He wants the Universal Heavyweight Championship. So, I don't know if that was the reason or not, but I'm going to assume that's the reason. I don't know why they took that and my opinion on that and the booking of the title... To heart, but it is what it is. I, I still enjoy their work. I, I think they're both great. I've praised Sammy up and down. And I'm going to praise Sammy again here tonight. Sammy came out. Fans are booing him tonight. And he's out there, and he's got what is a very heel coat on. And it's the type of coat where you just look at somebody, and you can pretty much think to yourself and know that they're a fucking asshole. He's got this big black coat. He's got the fucking fur. I I don't wear fur on my coat. I mean, it is what it is. But Sammy Guevara's out there with an obvious heel jacket. And Tay is standing next to him. Crowd is booing them in Pittsburgh. They were kissing. More boos. This is all going to get the heel heat, which is great. He's on top of the world. He loves being on top of the world, the Sammy Guevara. 
TNT champion for a third time standing next to the love of his life. Sammy says he loves everyone who cheers for them and supports them. He said he will give them his everything forever because they deserve it. Fans booed. And as for the rest of you, I hear you. Those who turn their backs on us, why? I don't know. Is it because my girlfriend is hotter than yours? You have one option. Be mad. So then out comes Scorpio Sky, Ethan Page, and Dan Lambert. I've been very high on Ethan Page for a good portion of his time in AEW. Uh, I do feel he got off to a slow start. I do think that he's turned it up a lot being with Dan Lambert and being with Scorpio Sky. I like this, th- this trio. I think Dan Lambert does add a lot to Scorpio and Ethan Page. But Ethan Page, man, he doesn't need Dan Lambert because he cuts a fucking vicious promo, man. More of Ethan Page on our TVs, please. He took the microphone and started screaming at Sammy Guevara and Tay Conti. First, Sky said his vlogs are stupid. Ethan then takes the microphone, starts yelling, told Sammy to shut the hell up. Ethan said there's not a single person here who came to listen to Sammy talk on a microphone. He said Lambert won't let him beat the shit out of him because Lambert is all about business. Lambert then gets the microphone from Ethan Page and said his grandfather said youth is wasted on the young because you have a big dream and big energy, but you lack judgment. He said he tried so hard to earn the fans' respect by risking everything in the ring, but then you choose to throw that away, acting like some high school douchebag who can't keep his tongue out of his girlfriend's mouth. So Conti then goes over and jams her tongue down Sammy's throat right there in the middle of the ring. Not really going to generate babyface reaction with a maneuver like that. So Conti is there kissing him. And Lambert said he can give Sky his rematch or else he's sending Sky and Ethan to the ring to give you, and I quote, this is the line of the year as far as I'm concerned in AEW so far. I'm going to send Ethan and Sky to the ring to give you the type of pounding your girlfriend dreams about. Dan Lambert is a man who is so eloquent with his words, man. I love it. Sammy says he doesn't give a shit about him or his dead grandpa. He said he just wants a match, and they both want it. He said he wants a mixed tag team match. So I love this. I love this. Dan Lambert wants something for Scorpio Sky. Sammy Guevara wants something for he and Tay to end this once and for all. So Sammy is willing to put the TNT Championship on the line against Scorpio Sky again. And Sammy is going to get a mixed tag team match out of it with himself and Tay teaming up against, uh, I guess, Ethan Page and Paige Van Zandt. Now, I don't know how long... Uh, how long Paige Van Zandt has been training and how far along she is in the training, I I don't know. But I like the idea of this. You give, and then I'll give right back. Let's make a deal. Now, Scorpio Sky and Sammy Guevara, we're getting a TNT Championship match next week on Dynamite, and it's going to be a ladder match for the TNT Championship. I love ladder matches, don't get me wrong. I think we are living in a day and age where the ladder match is abused. I don't agree with them having a ladder match for the TNT Championship. I don't. I don't know what match or what type of match AEW could do because I feel like everything we've seen would be kind of overkill. We've had a ladder match not too long ago with Sammy Guevara winning the title back from Cody Rhodes before he dropped it to Scorpio Sky. That ladder match was fucking great. That was probably the best ladder match in North America that I've seen in almost two decades on any promotion. Definitely the best ladder match I've seen on, on, on any show, period, that is, you know, basic wrestling TV during the week. Unbelievable match. The things that they did in that match, you'll never see duplicated again. But Scorpio Sky and Sammy Guevara, I don't know if a ladder match is going to be a right decision so soon after we just got a ladder match with Sammy and Cody Rhodes. 
I would say maybe a steel cage match, but then that comes so soon after Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa did it a couple of weeks ago when Thunder Rosa won the championship in Texas. So what do we do? What do we do? I feel like the TNT championship is just in this in this rut. You know, Sammy's, Sammy's great, but the hot potatoing of the title has not made the title look good. Miro defended that shit with fucking honor, blasted through everybody, and the title has been hot potatoed pretty much all year. Cody Rhodes, Sammy Guevara. Cody Rhodes, Sammy Guevara. Right? Scorpio Sky. Now back to Sammy Guevara. You can't really build prestige about a title or around the title if it's constantly going back and forth between new owners. And a ladder match, I feel like the ladder match is way overdone. Now, it's going to be a car wreck. Sammy Guevara and Scorpio Sky in a ladder match. I guarantee you those two are going to pull out some shit that we've never seen before. And they're going to need to because they have a lot to live up to with what Sammy and Cody did not too long ago. But I feel like we're in this rut, man. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It's almost like Tony Khan is uh, warping back in time and giving us a fucking replay. For the first time in AEW Dynamite history, I feel like we're getting a rerun. And I feel very weird about that. I want to complain about it, but I don't want to complain about it because of who is involved. But I don't think a ladder match in this particular uh, scenario is needed. I don't even know why we took the title off of Scorpio Sky to begin with. I don't know why we took the title off of Scorpio to put it on Sammy Guevara to begin with. He did nothing with that title. He defended it once and was against Wardlow. That was it. And that served a greater purpose because of Wardlow and MJF. That's all that did. It wasn't even about the TNT Championship. I feel like we're just going around in circles here. Bring back Miro. I can't wait for him to get done with this fucking filming of a pilot he's doing in Brooklyn. Miro needs to be back, man. We need some prestige back to that TNT title. But I will say this about Sammy. I'm not done with Sammy yet. Sammy out there, he embraced kind of, not completely because he still, you know, praised everybody that still supports him. Fine. You could, you could be a heel and still do that. But everybody else said, go fuck yourself, basically. He handled himself very well. His tone and his demeanor and his delivery was very heel-like tonight on Dynamite. And I honestly think we need to start exploring that. I don't want to see Sammy go in a way that Cody Rhodes went, where he was pretending to be this delusional babyface. Fans were booing him in every arena, and they didn't want to see anything about Cody Rhodes, and booed him and booed him and booed him. And he came out there pretending to be a fucking babyface, and he was ignoring everybody's boos. I don't want to see that for Sammy. I think Sammy, tonight he did a very good job at somewhat embracing it. Not fully, but he somewhat embraced it. Tay didn't really say anything. That's fine. Her actions speak louder than her words anyway. But I honestly think Sammy kind of embraced it tonight. He was definitely dressed the part. He was a prick on the microphone. And I honestly think we need to really amp it up a little by little by little as the weeks go on with Sammy. I I think this is going to be the right role for him. I don't want to take anything away from him because he's great, but I do think that him going full-blown heel is going to be the best move for him. Nobody wants to be stuck in a situation where their actions are ignoring the crowd or you're going and doing the opposite of what the reaction is from the audience watching you. It's never going to work out. And by that, if he does that, it's going to develop quickly into go-away heat. And we don't want go-away heat for Sammy. Not ever. He's too good. And I see a lot of people claiming with with all that he's doing with Tay Conti, oh, he's not one of the pillars of AEW anymore. Get the fuck out of here. Because of a slight miscasting character on TV, he's not one of the pillars of AEW anymore. Please, give me a fucking break. He's going to shut a lot of you people up next week. He will. In that ladder match. Don't necessarily think the ladder match is the right way to go about it, but I do think, just based on his body of work previously, that he's going to wow people in that match with Scorpio Sky. Buddy Matthews and Brody King talked about the rain washing away their shame. Then Alistair Black entered and said, next week, the sun dies. Not the sun as the sun in the sky. Not S-U-N. The sun dies. S-O-N. Who is he talking about? 
I don't know. But I do think that we seen this promo last week and he targeted Darby Allen. Is the son of Stink. Sting being targeted here. Quote, unquote. The son of Sting. Darby Allen. Is Darby Allen being targeted by Malachi Black? So we got to see what's going on there. But more Malachi on TV, man. I feel like Malachi is such an afterthought on TV. It goes to show you the, the level of fucking competition that exists in AEW right now. But somebody like this should really be on TV a little bit more. Honestly. Not once every fucking month. It's not really... Not really right for Malachi. He came in with such a bang, with such high hopes, and he's had some decent matches, but he's just a fucking afterthought. Honestly, I, I mean, I want to like the I want to like the House of Black. I do, but what is their per- what are they doing? What is their end goal? I really, I'm really interested to see where Julia Hart goes with all this. If she's going to be aligned with them. We've seen a a slight transformation in her as the weeks go on. She's not even on television uh, enough in her own right to really sell this. All we see is the eye patch, and the eye patch is the symbolism of, oh, yeah, she got spit in the eye by Malachi Black. So every time we see her, we're reminded. But there really isn't any, any connection there. Nothing's been said. Nothing's been done. I don't know what the direction is for the House of Black. Is it Fuego? Is he fighting Fuego Del Sol? That's his feud? That cannot be his feud. I hope it, because he, he called out Darby in his promo last week. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Where's Pac? I don't know. Hopefully Pac is a part of that New Japan show, man. Seriously. Hopefully Pac is a part of that New Japan show, and he's given a match where he could fucking tear the house down, man. Holy shit. It's another guy that needs to be on TV a little bit more. Danielle Camella versus Britt Baker. This was an Owen Hart Cup qualifier. This brought me back to a time where I watched NXT and I saw Aaliyah and Danielle Camella, then Vanessa Bourne, on my TVs every Wednesday at one hour. And I asked myself, why do I have to watch a portion of my one-hour show with such terrible fucking acting and some terrible in-ring performances? That's what I got when I saw Vanessa Bourne and Aaliyah on Wednesday night when NXT was still on the WWE Network in its glory days. Her match tonight with Britt Baker brought me back to every fucking nightmare I had about how terrible she is. Now, I watched Dark with Jesse last night, I popped into his stream where the audio was very good. He was low. I sounded exquisite, as always, but the audio was working there. And she wrestled Tony Storm. Now, Tony Storm pretty much squashed her in about three minutes, but she didn't look as bad as she did tonight, man, fumbling around. She's misstepping all over the place, and she's clearly there just to to, to put over Britt Baker and get Britt Baker to qualify for the tournament. I hope to fucking Jesus Christ himself that Tony Khan does not offer Danielle Camella a contract. She is fucking garbage. Every bit of her is... The best thing about Danielle Camella is her hair. Point blank, period. She sucks. She sucks. I do not want to see her on TV ever again. Get out of here. I don't understand why we continue to bring in these ex-WWE failed performance center talents. Danielle Camella, and we get Marina Shafir on television on Friday against Jade Cargill. I can't wait to see the fucking reports that come out of the dark show or or the the, the tapings after Dynamite tonight to to say how terrible that match is. I don't want to see them. Now, Britt, I'm glad Britt's back on television. Britt won the match. Britt qualified for the Owen Hart Cup. Obviously. Camilla, she got some offense in. She taunted with the the terrible towel. That's what they call the towel, the terrible towel. She started to choke out and smother Britt Baker with the terrible towel. Allowing Baker to come back with a tackle, some forearms, a very Adam Cole-esque Bay Bay sling blade. Baker landed a super kick, twisting neck breaker, curb stomp. Then uh, we got the 
Very Pittsburgh Steelers-esque glove applied. And we got the lockjaw, one, two, three, and Danielle Camella tapped out pretty instantaneously. And Britt Baker advances in the Owen Hart Cup tournament. After the match, Britt Baker got on the microphone and she had a couple of things to say. Baker addressed her hometown where they loved Britt Baker tonight as always. She said they finally get a woman in the ring with a mic who knows how to use it. She said the women's division has been a complete disaster without her. She took uh, several digs at Thunder Rosa, Tony Storm, Jade Cargill. She called out Jade Cargill for calling Pittsburgh ugly. She said there are uh, people who came to see Jade and her baddies, and being a baddie is worse than losing to her. So she then ended saying that she is the baddest bitch in AEW. Are we headed towards AJ Cargill versus Britt Baker match? I wonder if that's going to be set up for double or nothing because Jade has theoretically run through everybody else and anybody that is not at the level of Britt Baker is pretty much going to be fed and people are going to feel that Jade is going to run right through anybody. We need to start getting Jade some legit competition and it may end up starting with Britt Baker. So we'll see what happens. And Britt, Britt Baker may be the one to take down Jade Cargill. We don't know. If Britt isn't going to be in the world title picture with Thunder Rosa because it doesn't work that way in AEW, maybe Tony Khan gives her the TNT championship and she now takes the secondary belt and does whatever she needs to do with the secondary belt while Jade maybe moves on to the world championship. Maybe Thunder Rosa is holding that belt and keeping it warm for Jade Cargill. That's what I was thinking during the show tonight. Maybe we just switch roles. Jade is slowly but surely outgrowing the TNT Championship. She's run through everybody. If she's not going to have stiff competition in there, then what's the point? There's no point. It's not making the title look better. Jade, we know what she's capable of just by the, the, the fact that she's 30 and 0. We may be getting a, a role reversal here. Britt may be the one to beat Jade, and then Jade goes on to challenge Thunder Rosa. We'll see what happens. I have no idea who Thunder Rose is going to be challenging at the pay-per-view or what her next feud is going to be. Hopefully, it's something a lot more pleasing than what we got with Nyla Rose. I felt like that was a fucking disaster in its own right. She needs something really, really solid. Thunder Rose's title reign, and it's not her fault, has got off on the wrong foot. We need some legit competition in there for Thunder Rosa going into double or nothing. We got a vignette about Serena Deeb and Jamie, uh, no, Serena Deeb and not Jamie Hader. Uh, Jamie Hader is wrestling Tony Storm in the first round of the Owen Hart Cup. It's Serena Deeb and Hikaru Shida. We're getting a Philadelphia street fight next week on Dynamite, which hopefully will end this feud. So nice little vignette between these two ladies. We saw Serena Deeb uh, doing some exercises by taking a sledgehammer and pounding on a large tire, and then Sheeta was standing there, all menacing looking with her kendo stick, and this is going to be a Philadelphia street fight. I hope the ladies really bring out the big guns, man. I really hope they go balls to the wall in this to really put a squash on this entire feud. And then we can see these two ladies maybe, maybe cross paths in the Owen Hart Cup. We'll see. Andrade El Idolo. And Darby Allen, this was a coffin match. Main event time for AEW Dynamite. He is there with the AFO, the Andrade family office, which I do think needs to come to an end in its own right. I think Andrade needs to be by himself. I think after tonight, I think he needs to dump everybody and really get on a page where he goes and wins the TNT Championship. That's what I think needs to happen. So we got this match here. Very fun match. It was all over the place. They were in the ring. They were in the crowd, back in the ring. We got some nice spots in this thing. Darby hit Andrade with his skateboard and kept the Blade, who was there outside, uh, kept him uh, away from everything. And he was overwhelmed eventually by the numbers advantage with an attack from Mark Quinn. No Isaiah Cassidy out there. Andrade tossed Darby out into the ringside area in the crowd. And then Quinn, he ripped up a sign held up by a fan in a sting mask. 
So I love this spot. I, I didn't even think anything of it. He ripped up this sign, and this guy sitting in the crowd, he's wearing a sting mask. He gets up, he takes the sting mask off, only to reveal himself as Sting. It's great. Look at that, man. Nobody would expect that. A Sting mask, and Sting was wearing his own mask, disguised himself in his own mask. Love it. So Sting is beating down both Blade and Mark Quinn with a trash can. That's got to suck. Who the fuck knows what's in there? So these, uh, all these guys, they're, they're brawling up the little pathway there to one of the mezzanine sections. And Quinn and Sting are on this set of raised stairs. Quinn hits Sting with a chair. Sting was draped over one of the banisters. Quinn is crossed on a banister himself. Takes a steel chair, handed to uh, him by Andrade. Bashes Sting over the back with it. Sting no-sells it. He gets up. He looks right at Mark Quinn. Quinn knows he fucked up. Sting fired up and tossed Quinn off the stairs. He then circles around to the mezzanine. Jumps off the mezzanine because this is what Sting does in 2022. He jumps off the mezzanine. He takes out Blade. He takes out Quinn. He takes out Andrade. And 60, how old is he? 66 years old? Jumping off fucking mezzanines in 2022, man. And he looks natural doing it. Sting risked life and limb to fly off the mezzanine into these pile of bodies. So... They're, they're back in the ring. Andrade and Darby, we finally get order here. No DQ. We're finally getting order back in the ring here. Andrade and Darby trapped behind a chair in the corner. Darby used the chair to trip up Andrade. This was a great spot. Darby was in the corner. He had a steel chair. Andrade went for his running knees, his patented running knees. Darby threw the chair at Andrade as he seen the knees coming, which was a great spot. He then hit a beautiful code red he went for a coffin drop on the floor soon thereafter. Andrade caught him, reversed it into a German release suplex on the outside. Andrade then put Darby in the coffin, but the lid was open. You got to close the lid to win the match. I remember the old school WWF casket matches where you got to close the lid shut and slam it to win the match. Uh, I, I miss those old school casket matches, man. These coffin matches seem like uh, child's play compared to whatever the caskets were in WWE when The Undertaker brought them out. So, Andrade's in the coffin. And uh, inside the coffin lid was thumbtacks. The entire underbelly of the coffin lid was thumbtacked everywhere. Ridiculous. Scattered all about with thumbtacks. And this was making it uh, difficult for Darby to grip. So, Andrade got out of the casket. Darby's in the casket now. Uh, Andrade's trying to close the lid. Darby's fucking punishing himself by holding the casket lid open with his forearm as the thumbtacks pierce his flesh. So they jockeyed for position here, and Andrade carried Darby up the ramp backwards in a vertical suplex and then dropped him on the ramp in a vertical suplex. So now they're on the ramp, and there's this little... Uh, I don't know what it was, but there was lights surrounding this grate. I'm, I'm assuming it was an electrical pit of sorts with a, a steel grate on top. They jock for position up by this grate, and Andrade suplexed Darby onto this grate, made a fucking huge bang, ridiculous spot there. Back near the coffin, Andrade tried to power slam Darby into it. Darby uh, took him out of the casket, and, and they're fighting away from the casket. They go back into the ring. He does a stun dog millionaire over the top rope to Andrade in the ring, and he landed a missile suicide dive sending Andrade from the ring apron into the coffin. They both land in the coffin. So Darby couldn't close the lid to the coffin. So Jose, the assistant, takes off his shirt, and he tried to attack Darby. Darby dropped Jose onto the thumbtacked uh, door of the casket, which was open all the way, slammed him into the thumbtacks. He goes uh, and gets away from the carnage that's going on here. And Darby dropped Jose onto the thumbtacks, Slammed the coffin with Andrade in it already. Shut. He lays on top of it. The bell rings. And Darby Allen beats Andrade in the coffin match. That was it. I honestly thought the match was highly entertaining. I, I thought that first match was better than what we saw here. A lot, of, a lot of gimmicks and a lot of, you know, hokey shit. 
and all over the place, just uh, reckless booking here. But I love that first match that they had a couple of weeks back, and I did not like this ending. I, I thought the ending was lame. I thought the way that they got to the ending was lame, and Andrade losing to me is lame. When are we going to get Andrade back into the winning, the winning ways? Like, what, what's going on here with Andrade? This guy is way too good to be having caskets shut on him. He's way too good to be hanging around Private Party and Butcher and Blade. I love my boys in Private Party. I think Butcher and Blade are great. I don't even think he needs Jose. Andrade needs to get back to the winning ways, man. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to take, and I doubt Tony Khan is going to bring him on into AEW. But at this point, I mean, Tommy Dreamer got his job back with uh, Impact Wrestling after the fucking dark side of the ring fiasco, right? If Ric Flair is on social media wrestling scrimmage with Jay Lethal, I don't know why he would be doing that when he doesn't need to. Is Ric Flair scrimmaging with Jay Lethal, a AEW superstar, Because he's getting ready to come back to television. I know you guys may not like it. And it may ruffle some feathers. But honestly, I think if Andrade brought in Ric Flair and fired everybody else that doesn't belong with him. This is his father-in-law, going to be his father-in-law. I think this would be great for uh, AEW television. I do. Uh, I think Andrade and Ric Flair, no matter what you think or whatever, no matter how you feel or whatever the case, but get over it, you fucking pussies. Get over it. Tommy Dreamer got his job back with Impact Wrestling. They don't seem to care, so why the fuck would you care? Who gives a shit? Jim Ross isn't even working with Dark Side of the Ring because he felt like he was misinterpreted and they changed shit up on him in post-production. He's not even working with them anymore and the team that makes those documentaries. So he's done for there. He's not putting himself through that anymore. So why not? Why not Ric Flair? Don't you think Andrade will look better with Ric Flair than he would with the fucking Butcher and Blade and Private Party and Jose losing matches and feuding with the fucking Hardys? Come on, man. Seriously. Andrade, no, Charlotte Charlotte is still with Andrade. Follow Andrade's social media. Follow his Instagram. They are still together, very much together. Everything about their, uh, their split and their breakup was overly fabricated. But I think Andrade and Ric Flair would be much better television than whatever the fuck he's doing now, man. The guy is mega talented. You talk about one of the best wrestlers on the planet being fucking directionless on AEW television. I can't stand that, man. Moving on with Dynamite next week, man. We got a Philly Street fight. Hikaru Shida and Serena D. Wardlow versus Lance Archer. I can't read it as fast as uh, Excalibur does on the show. I don't know how the fuck he does it. Owen Hart Cup qualifier. Dax Harbour versus Cash Wheeler. This is awesome. They obviously both want to be in the Owen Hart Cup. They can't, right? They can't both qualify. So they're going to do... Or yeah, actually, they both can qualify if Tony Khan wanted them to. But the, you can't have one in the tournament and then not the other, right? So what are they doing? They're going to fight it out. Tony Khan's putting them in a match together. Dax versus Cat should be a fucking banger. Can't wait to see that, man. That's very interesting. That is going to be awesome. I love the risks. You see, I love the fucking risks, man. I said this on Monday. Where is the risk on Monday night? There is none. TNT Championship ladder match. Sammy Guevara versus Scorpio Sky. Adam Cole, the Bucks, and Red Dragon versus... Varsity Blondes, Dante Martin, Lee Johnson, and Brock Anderson. Rampage this Friday. Adam Cole versus Tomohiro Ishii. Jade Cargo versus Marina Shafir. Keith Lee and Swerve will have an interview with Tony Schiavone. Lance Archer versus Serpentico. Eddie Kingston versus Daniel Garcia. And Jamie Hayter and Tony Storm, along with Britt Baker, will also be interviewed by Tony Schiavone. Good stuff coming up, man. That seems like a loaded rampage for one hour. They call it the fastest hour of pro wrestling during your week. We'll see what happens there, man. It's a lot to digest on a Friday night. And Dynamite next week looks fucking awesome, as always. Guys, we're going to get into the Super Chats. I feel good. I feel a lot better 
than I did at the start of the stream. I love Jesse like a brother, man, I do, but he's got to get his situation figured out. When I tell you, we had a 30-minute Discord phone call yesterday morning. We had another 10 minutes today before Dynamite at 7 o'clock to go over all the sound and everything was working. He sounded good. He sounded as good as I can accept. There was no echo. There was no static. All of a sudden, he gets on tonight, man. It's almost as if fucking Dan Housen cursed him. Instead of cursing Hook. I don't know. I don't know, man. But I appreciate you sticking out, uh, sticking with me, man, and hanging out with me. Sticking it out with me. I, I appreciate you guys. Uh, I, I, again, I apologize for the, uh, the rough start again, man, which seems to be a regular thing on Wednesdays. I, I am such a stickler for audio and visual, man, as you see with the fucking venue. Taking this thing to the next level. I can't be next level, man, if, if things like that are going to be a, a consistent thing. You know, I, I pride myself on what I do weekly, man. I, I I don't sleep at night because I'm such a fucking perfectionist. So I don't know what we're going to do, man. We'll figure something out. Yes, we got to get Jesse a new microphone, man. That microphone fucking sucks. Whatever he's using fucking sucks. But I appreciate you, man. We got some things in the works, man. I, I, I my, my brain has been working. My brain has been working. We're about to hit up my, uh, my boys over at DV8 Designs, man. I'm kind of aiming for the forbidden door, man. It's going to be summer. It's going to be a little bit warmer outside. The weather's going to get nicer. The days are going to get longer, which I love. The beer, not so good in the summertime, man. My favorite time to drink is the fall. But we're going to have some cold beverages regardless of the season, man. We're going to have some nice summery drinks. I'm thinking we're going we're gonna to get out of the, the dark and fucking elegant venue. And I think we're going to kind of cozy up for the summer inside a nice beer garden outside man nice fire pit maybe some uh some jenga maybe some cornhole right and the mustang driving in the twilight of night to the fucking beer garden man this all sounds very good man palm trees blowing nicely in the wind man i'm giving myself fucking i want to go on vacation vibes man should be good so uh, my brain is working overdrive, man. We're gonna be uh, we're gonna be walking through the OTS forbidden door, man. Where's this beer garden gonna be, man? Undisclosed location, destination unknown. Always gotta ramp it up, man. Always gotta take it to the next level. So we'll see what's going on. Anyway, guys, uh, follow me on social media at JD from NY206. That's Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for notifications. Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up, man. We need 80. 80 likes for a thousand. The minimum here is a thousand. So make sure you guys hit that thumbs up, man. Helps me out tremendously on the podcast. Super chats are still open, man. Last call at the bar. So get them on in. We're going to hang out in just a second. Hit that join button as well. Become a VIP right here in the OTS venue. Sit right back there with me, man. We're going to get a new VIP room too. If we're moving into the beer garden. We're going to get a new VIP room, man. Nice and cozy, man. Nice and cozy. Perfect, perfect setting for you to enjoy a nice old fashioned. And also, go check out today's extra. Talk about FTR being wanted by WWE, Alexa Bliss being frustrated. Where's Bray Wyatt and why he hasn't joined the major promotion? All that today on the extra. Also, we were live for NXT last night. Nobody gave a shit. And Monday Night Raw, we were live on Monday Night Raw talking about Cody Rhodes and what he's got going on as long as. They keep doing what they're doing with him. He should be okay. And then Kevin Owens and the lie detector test with Ezekiel. It's amazing how Kevin Owens goes from a main event of WrestleMania to a fucking comedy storyline. He's owning it. But the creative just sucks. Anyway, let's get into the Super Chats, guys. Let's start at the top here. We got... Joseph Taylor with a $5 Super Chat. Let me take a sip of my cold beverage. Two things. Happy 420. And give me the Grizzled Young Veterans versus the Young Bucks. Grizzled Young Veterans may be on their way out of WWE as well, man. They cut a very, what seemed to be a real promo tonight. Or not tonight, today. I seen it posted today on social media. Who knows what's going on with them, man. Drake and Gibson 
again, too good for that hellhole of a Tuesday night show they call NXT. Michelle Moran with a $2 super chat. Looks like Lee Moriarty will be in the Blackpool Combat Club soon. I could see it. I could definitely see it. Brian has definitely wanted to work more with him, so I could definitely see that happening. Joseph Taylor says with the $2 super chat, where are my hookers at? Everybody's a hooker, man. Especially the ones in Atlantic City on Pacific Avenue at 5 a.m., man. You don't want to be around those hookers, though. Nobody wants to be around those hookers. Tony Brown with a 999 Super Chat. Real wrestling hooks the man. It's the start of everybody's wrestling week, brother. Wednesday. Michelle Moran with a $2 Super Chat. Is it possible that Paige will beat Punk? No. I do not think so. Unless... Unless we get something where Paige beats Punk and then Punk wins the title in Chicago. I don't know. If Punk gets a title shot, he wins it on his first try, man. Anything else? I don't know how that works. Marcus is AEW with a $5 Super Chat. Man, JD, Tony Khan keeps delivering the goods. Forbidden Door, June 26th in my city, Chicago. Take my money, please. Thank you for everything you do, JD and Jesse. Thank you, Marcus. I may have to make a trip out to Chicago, man. Maybe we, uh... Maybe we have a fucking home vlog with Jesse cooking some fucking tacos, man. Shell John with a 999 Super Chat. The graphic for the Forbidden Door looks amazing. I got the Forbidden Door graphic queued up, man. I should have showed it earlier. Here we go. Look at that. The Forbidden Door, man. United Center. June 26, 8 p.m. Live on pay-per-view going to be awesome love it absolutely love it man that is a great fucking design whoever AEW's got design in their shit man they know what the fuck they're doing Tony Brown with a 499 super chat Bay Bay is so blessed you know it brother not only does he got a good woman by his side but he's also one of the best pro wrestlers on the face of the earth gotta love Bay Bay Michelle Moran with a $2 Super Chat. Darby aligned with Sting and the Hardys made men. I think Darby was on his way to being a made man without Sting. Sting has only helped Darby, which is a beautiful thing to see. Ray G with 1,000 in yen on tonight's Dynamite Post Show. The Forbidden Door finally will be getting to see the big names on AEW television. Personally, with like Pac versus Naito. Have a great evening, everybody. I take that, bro. Tetsuya Naito versus Pac. Sign me up. Michael Evans with a $10 super chat. I watched the extra earlier. East Shields always criticized TK for signing Endeavor to eat talent. Yet they're allowed to become stars in AEW. Now all of a sudden they're worth something. Criticize Vince McMahon, geeks. Yeah. I, I said this today on the extra. FTR is not going anywhere. They got another year at least on their contract. But when the contract is up, why would they even entertain going back to WWE? The tag team division is legitimately the same division that they left two years ago. What are they going back to? The same teams are on top. The Usos and the New Day. There's no new tag teams built in, AEW, in, uh, in WWE. For them to want to leave AEW. It's not going to work that way. And, and why would they go back based on how they were treated as well, man? It's a double whammy. If anything, it shows, and I'll talk about this again on Off the Script this weekend. If anything, it shows WWE likes to be the Cliff Notes version or likes to read the Cliff Notes version of how to create a star. Yes, yeah, send them over to, you know, the unemployment line. Have Tony Khan pick them up. Have Tony Khan make them into a star. They get national TV exposure. They get booked better than they were in WWE. And then WWE wants them back. It's like WWE is so fucking lazy that they can't put the effort into create stars. So they have Tony Khan do it. <laughs> what a joke. What a, a joke. It's fucking disgusting. It is disgusting, man. Awful. Joseph Taylor with a $2 Super Chat. Give me Chris Jericho versus Tanahashi number two. I could see that. I could absolutely see that. 
Brandon James Shea with a $5 Super Chat. AW Diamond is a good show. 10 out of 10. I don't know if it was a 10 out of 10 show, Brandon, but uh, I appreciate your enthusiasm. Joseph Taylor with a $2 Super Chat. But Jesse said I can smoke in the venue. No. Now, Jesse can't even get his microphone situation sorted. He's going to tell you to smoke in the venue. There's no smoking allowed in the venue. And I, to uh, many people's beliefs, contrary to beliefs, I, I do not smoke. I do not smoke cigarettes. I do not smoke weed. I only indulge in the finest of cold beverages when, when it is appropriate. TNZM with a UK 179 Super Chat. No message. Bro, throw it in, in the tip jar, man. Issa could use it. I, I don't need it. You, 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 can't be, you can't be walking into the venue and then want to be shy, bro. Come on. Jeremy Slapnut with a 199 Super Chat. JD, what you smoking? Drank a quart of milk and puked. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I do not smoke. I, I do not smoke a single thing, bro. Uh, Issa, speaking of which, with the 199 Super Chat. Don't renew Jesse's contract. Just ghost him. Issa. I, I can't ghost Jesse because I have been ghosted before in past relationships and it's a terrible fucking feeling. Um, but Jesse needs to have uh, a serious... Maybe maybe I'll leave you to Jesse. Maybe you should teach him a lesson. Seriously. I don't know, I don't know if I'm uh, capable of teaching him as good of a lesson as you can. Nobody wants to be on the receiving end of a Puerto Rican woman's wrath. That much, I know. Man of a thousand five holes with a $2 super chat. Jesse got Dan Housen. Yes, he did. He got cursed. JT Golden with a four ninety nine super chat. Them tacos got Jesse lacking. All you is some sour cream, bro. I'm going to dump sour cream all over. Uh, Yes. Yes, I agree. Beverages tomorrow. I'm all in. Uh, EJ Garcia with a five-month membership. Thank you for the recommitment, EJ. Jesse is cursed by Dan Housen. OTS for life. JD, love you, bro. Uh, how did the show come out? I mean, after after we got the sound... I mean, my, my sound is always situated, but after the sound was uh, fixed... And we got the show on the road. How, how, how was the show tonight? Everything was the way it should be, right? Yeah, great. Tommy Brannigan with a five dollar super chat. The Chicago Forbidden Door is going to be absolutely awesome. Looking forward to it. OTS for life. Spirit of the Wolf with a five dollar super chat. Tony Khan puts the all in all elite wrestling. You name it, man. Oh, you you you. 100% on that, brother. And you use the JD beer emoji. Absolutely. You know it. Okada is the IWGP champion. Tanahashi versus Osprey for the vacant IWGP United States title. United Empire, Jeff Cobb and Great Okan are the IWGP tag team champions. Jay kicked God out of the Bullet Club. Just some New Japan updates. Uh, I don't watch any of that. And I didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of that stuff, uh, Tristan. Thank you for the 999 Super. I didn't know uh, Tanahashi versus Osprey is for the vacant IWGP United States title. Derek Anawaii with a $1 Super Chat and then a $2 Super Chat. I get paid next week, Oos, but here is to you. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate you, brother. The Undertaker with a $5 Super Chat. Just saw Alter Bridges' manager confirm they were booked to play for Edge live at WrestleMania 36 before COVID hit. So what the fuck happened? So what happened this year? Did they raise the budget? Did Alter or did Alter Bridge raise their price, I should say? 
Well, they're in the studio writing a new album anyway, man. They, 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 they got their things uh, all situated for the new album. I hope it's great. It should be great. I enjoyed the last album. Not really as good as their other stuff, but we got that. Mark Tremonti's got 14 songs he's releasing covering Frank Sinatra songs. Man, it should be good, a good year. Should be a good year. Mickey McLendon with a 999 Super Chat. I'll be at the show next week in Philly. Hopefully TK rides the crowd reaction. Lambert and Scorp got tonight and takes the strap off Sammy. He suffocated the TNT title scene since October. We need new blood. I agree, brother. I agree. Francis Loop with a $5 Super Chat. If Eddie Kingston needs two more guys for his group, isn't he best friends with the Lucha Brothers? The Butcher and the Blade per 2020 storylines. Yeah. He's best friends with Penta. Uh, TLG Kevin, I see you in the chat, bro. Have you, anyone listened to... Has, has anyone listened to the new Papa Roach album? I skimmed 30 seconds of each song. It's fucking absolutely abysmal. It's what Limp Bizkit did this year with their, uh, their last effort. Awful. Don't even sound like Papa Roach, man. Francis Loop with a $10 Super Chat. We don't need another Penelope Ford. If that county is going to be heel, biggest way is to turn on Anna J. Anna needs something serious instead of tag team matches on Dark every week. Jay Coyle with a UK $5 Super Chat. Miss Raw on Monday. So thought I'd watch it before Dynamite came on and I fell asleep and missed Dynamite. Bro, listen, never, never mix Monday and Wednesday, bro. It's not good for your health. It is not good for your health, man. Francis Loop with a $10 Super Chat. Sorry, take Conti. I was wondering what you meant by that country or that county. Take Conti. That's one hell of a fucking... Uh, typo there, brother. Anna can disapprove of Tay's on-screen behavior and then Tay can tell Anna to mind her own business. They go back and forth in promos for weeks until they have a tag team match. I like it. Magician Sapphire with a $10 super chat. Since this looks like the blow-off between Andrade and Darby, what's next for Andrade? Does he finally chase and win the AEW TNT Championship or have him chase and win the ROH World Championship? I don't know. I don't know, man. Uh, everybody in the chat, if you have not hit the thumbs up, man, what are you waiting for? We need a thousand minimum. There's 1,700 people in here, man. There should be a thousand minimum in the live stream chat. 25 more likes. It's not that difficult to do, man. The uh, thumbs up turn, turns a nice blue color when you, when you hit it. So you know that you actually hit it. Francis Loop with a $5 super chat. Tay turns on Anna during the match and leaves the ring, leaving Anna by herself. This then explodes until they get into a backstage altercation. Bro, why don't you hit up Tony Khan and pitch the storyline, bro? I like it. Tay and Anna eventually get a match where Tay cheats to win. Their heated rivalry, rivalry will blow off in the first ever women's sexist death match where both ladies beat the shit out of each other into bloody messes. Anna gets the win decisively, ending their feud. Anna comes out on dynamite, not medically cleared, wearing a white bandage on her forehead. Tay will be out of action for a couple weeks, selling the injury. Francis Loop, brother. Well, well, listen. Go hit up Tony Khan on Twitter, man. He, he's uh, he's known to answer uh, tweets if he likes them. Fuzzy with the two dollar super chat. Mox needs to get. His 5,000 yen back from Toriano. Gotham guy with a fight off Super Chat. JD, I just love the way Tony did the Forbidden Door pay-per-view announcement, including Cole and White. You felt their energy. Great example of show, don't tell. I did enjoy that, bro. I did enjoy that. I thought Adam Cole was the perfect candidate to do that announcement. The Quiet Storm 08 with a new membership to the OTS VIP Club. Quiet Storm, thank you, brother. What are you drinking, man? First round is on me. Paul Van Tassel becomes a member for 17 months. Thank you for the recommitment, Paul Van Tassel, man. You're almost there. Tony Storm is my pick to win the Women's Owen Hart Cup Tournament. Mine included, bro. I'm going Tony Storm all the way. Jason Lucas 
with a 499 super chat. Drop in the bucket for Jesse's new mic. Thank you, Jason. We appreciate you, brother. OJ with a $10 super chat was told earlier this week that the titles are props and don't have prestige. I get in WWE titles are treated like trash, but what the hell are we watching if they don't truly really matter? Twitter is dumb. W which titles are props, bro? Not the AEW titles. The TNT title's been the poorly booked title in all the company, but everything else has been great. WWE titles are props, man. The US titles are props. The Intercontinental titles are props. The tag team titles are props. None of them mean shit. The women's tag team titles are fucking props. OJ with a $5 super chat. Also, Charlotte is very flawed for someone that's the best. Charlotte fans like Bully are insert stupid brawn noise. Ah, <laughs> uh, stupid. Bully's an idiot. This guy had the fucking gall to say fans are jealous of Charlotte. That's why they don't speak highly of her. I'm jealous of Charlotte. <laughs> Give me a break, man. Charlotte sucks. She is fucking overrated, man. It may be a little bit too much for me to say she sucks. She's nowhere near the best of all time. No, you're not even the best in the fucking company. I'll take that to the fucking grave, man. I'll hang my brave hat on that fucking hill and fight to the death. CK920 with a $1 super chat. No message, bro. Put it in the fucking tip jar, man. Issa could use it to teach Jesse a lesson. Brandon James Shea with a $2 super chat. My birthday is June 16, 1992. I will be 30. We're not there yet, brother. The Kingdom Kid with a $4.99 super chat. Think we see Brett during the Dax and Cash match next week. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. That would be a perfect fucking opportunity to debut him. Neb with a $2 super chat. Can we get your best Lacey Evans impression? I don't have one yet, brother. Give me a couple of weeks, man. I don't know what the fuck is going on with Lacey Evans. That shit sucks. God, they're, they're taking a fucking plunger, man, and they're fucking suffocating you with that shit. That shit sucks so much. Holy shit. And we got a $20 super chat from Please Behave. Thank you, brother. Is Orange Cassidy hurt? I think he is hurt. That would explain his absence from TV. I think he's hurt. He's hurt. Not that I miss him or anything, but uh, Orange Cassidy was uh, a regular on TV. He was even mixing up with Dan Housen. So I do think he's hurt. Anyway, guys, uh, again, I appreciate you. Thank you for sticking it out with me. A little bit of technical difficulties. We tried to get it all uh, situated. Had to do the show without Jesse tonight. I don't know what is going to happen moving forward, man, until he gets his shit situated, man. I can't be, I can't be having that shit on Wednesday nights, man. So we'll figure it out. I'll, uh, I'll hit him up tomorrow and see what's going on. But I appreciate you, man, hanging out tonight. We had uh, over 2,000 in the venue tonight for a Dynamite. 1,000 likes. The minimum goal is hit. Thank you guys so much. If there is uh, still anybody floating around on their way out, make sure you guys hit that thumbs up, man. I appreciate you all. Thank you for all the Super Chats tonight. Excellent Super Chat night. Two new members joined the VIP room. Thank you guys very much for all of your support. The Quiet Storm 08. Thank you for becoming a new member tonight in the OTS venue. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. Make sure you go check out today's extra and any other contents on the channel, on the homepage. If you guys want more additional content, there is plenty for you there. Hit up my sponsor for today's show, man, Manscaped. Manscaped.com. You're going to use that code SCRIPT20 at checkout. 20% off and free shipping. And follow me on social media, guys. At JD from NY206 on Twitter and on the IG. I'm getting out of here, guys. But before I do, I need a couple of things from my fellow OTS patrons. Number one, I need those guitar emojis in the chat. My VIPs, you got them. Let me see them. Let me see those Mustang emojis. 
And number two, guys, I need that music on max. I will see you back on Friday live from the OTS venue. SmackDown and AEW Rampage right here on Off the Scripts. I will see you guys later.